history has a long effect on uh, what goes on. So, Bruce, you're starting out. Okay. And so, go for it. Okay, thank you, Peter. Well, given that this is a uh, panel on that quintessential Enlightenment thinker, Adam Smith, I can think of no better way to start my remarks than to invoke that most enlightened of modern economists, uh, Kenneth Boulding, who in 1971 penned the delightful essay titled, After Samuelson, Who Needs Adam Smith? Okay. Now, Boulding's, uh, Boulding's wonderfully titled piece is not, in fact, an attack on Adam Smith, but a spirited defense of the study of the history of economic thought, which even in 1971 was, as he put it, viewed by many economists as, at best, a slightly depraved entertainment. This bias against the history of economic thought gained credibility in the 20th century as three assumptions took hold in the minds of economists. Namely, number one, that economics is a real science. Number two, that most successful sciences exhibit cumulative progress. So that number three, the study of History by students of economics is unnecessary because all the important findings of the discipline, as the saying goes, are contained in the latest working paper. Now, on this positivist view, the study of the history of economics might amuse, but it's also an, an, an unnecessary diversion from the important scientific work at hand. Bolding pithily and wickedly summarized the position as reducing to the claim that all we have to learn is embedded in the present scriptures. <laughs> Bolding offered in response to this unfortunately ubiquitous view a defense of what he called the principle of the extended present. For Bolding, and I quote here, works like the wealth of nations are inevitably part of an extended present because one can still go back to Adam Smith after many rereadings and find insights which one had never noticed before and which may have marked impact on one's own thought. He pointed out how reading masters like Smith and others provide students with a feeling for the peak achievements of the human mind, noting that most of the things that one has to read in college are, after all, the products of minds, to put it gently, which are of a certain mediocrity. He argued, too, that one of the great purposes of formal education is to give the student a sense of the extended present, for it's a mark of intellectual poverty to know only one's own time and place. Now, Boulding's essay is in itself an example of the sort of writing that he was talking about, and we can add some further arguments uh, to those that he made back in 1971. Uh, two that I'd like to uh, add to his, uh, his essay is that if one questions the positivist assumption that economics is a science characterized by the steady accumulation of certain knowledge, then the idea that we might actually have something to learn from the studying of past writers becomes much more credible. For those unhappy with the current state of affairs, which I assume is probably uh, going to be overrepresented in this room, uh, the argument becomes very uh, nearly self-evident. Now, from its very origins, INET uh, has established, uh, established its commitment uh, to supporting research in the history of economic thought and in related fields such as the philosophy and methodology of economics. This is demonstrated not only by the first and, uh, conference in the Bretton Woods Conference, but this conference here where the emphasis is, is evident, as it was also at the, uh, at the festival that took place for the last uh, two days uh, where it was prominently uh, on display. So rather than continuing to, uh, to preach uh, to the distinguished choir that's uh, uh, arrayed before me today, I'll use the rest of my time to instead discuss a problem that I think is an important one uh, for anyone who is looking at the history of economics for any kind of guidance to, uh, to, to bear always in mind. And this is simply the problem of, of interpretation. I don't mean to dive here into the murky waters of, of historiography or uh, historical methodology, but rather just simply to make the common sense observation that interpretive questions pervade uh, the field of the history of economic thought. Uh, how do we interpret the meaning of a particular text? How have practicing economists in the past interpreted the meaning of texts. Uh, sometimes readings are complementary, but sometimes they conflict. What does one do at a, when one's confronted with that sort, of, uh, that sort of dilemma? So it turns out that Adam Smith is a particularly good example or case study for showcasing the varieties and the vagaries of the interpretive enterprise. 
to begin at the beginning, much of British classical political economy, thinking here of the, the writings of people like Ricardo and Maltus, and uh, we invoked Samuelson early on. Uh, Samuelson would include Marx as a minor post-Ricardian. That was one of his uh, uh, more wicked uh, observations. Uh, anyway, all of these writers took as their starting point the critique, supplementation, or emendation of Smith's writings, all of which required interpretation, obviously, of what he wrote. If we move outside of Britain, we find that the early reception of Smith by German scholars was decidedly less than warm. Uh, because of the time that he spent in France and because of his invocation of laissez-faire, uh, they saw him as a sort of Scottish uh, physiocrat, which given the fraught relations between France and the various German states at the time, was not meant as a compliment. He's given me a pen, but I don't know what quite to do with it. Okay, never mind. Uh, middle of the 18th century, members of the German historical school were convinced that the purportedly general economic laws that the British classicals had claimed to discover regarding, for example, the virtues of free trade uh, were not general at all. They were suspicious that the benefits of free trade mostly benefited the British Empire, and they reacted accordingly. Now, they're called the German historical school because they thought that a generalizing theoretical approach to the social sciences was wrong-headed that the proper approach would study the unique historical development of each country, its political, juridical, economic, and cultural institutions, its moral foundations, its relations with neighbors, to discover the best sort of policies for that particular country's uh, particular point in time and phase of development. It was this group of scholars who first came up with what has since been termed das Adam Schmidt problem, okay? The alleged inconsistency between Smith's theory of moral sentiments, where sympathy was the mainstream or mainspring of human action, and the wealth of nations, where self-interest was. Now, most later writers agree that Das Adam Smith's problem is, in fact, an illusion, uh, that the two books are not merely uh, not inconsistent, but indeed complementary. And Craig Smith will speak to this uh, point uh, in, in his presentation uh, after mine. Uh, but one could see how the interpretive exercise of undermining Smith was essential uh, for promoting the competing views of the German historical school. Now, if one fast forwards uh, to the early 20th century, we find the old Chicago school economist Jacob Viner writing about Smith on the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Wealth of Nations. Viner's piece, Adam Smith and Laissez-Faire, is a classic in the interpretive literature, one that I've assigned in my classes for, for decades. Uh, writing in America in the middle of the 1920s, Viner was taking on the progressive and institutionalist critics of the market system, who following the lead of the German historical school, in fact, dismissed Adam Smith as a single-minded and simple-minded promoter of laissez-faire. Viner was a liberal in the classical or European sense, and one of the chief messages of his paper is to remind Smith's antagonists that though the Scotsman had articulated a general case for limiting government interference in the economy, he also allowed for many exceptions. Indeed, as Viner summarized, had Smith, and I quote Viner here, been brought face to face with a complete list of the modifications to the principles of laissez-faire to which he at one place or another had granted his approval, I have no doubt he would have been astounded. Now, Viner was defending Smith but also a Smithian vision of the market system. He was pointing out that to accuse defenders of markets of embracing a strict adherence to laissez-faire was itself unfair, that most students of economics who defended markets were not, in the language of today, market fundamentalists. It's telling that both John Maynard Keynes and Friedrich Hayek, writing in 1926 and 1933 respectively, made points exactly similar to Viner's. All three of them were liberals, while at the same time critics of what Hayek would later decry, and this is, these words are taken from the road to serfdom, uh, no less, the wooden insistence on certain rough rules of thumb, above all, the principle of laissez-faire, is something to be decried. Though the three men differed, to be sure, on how best to organize a liberal society in the context of their times, they were all on the same side. And if that statement seems bizarre to you, it only shows how short our historical memory can be and the importance of embracing, in fact, Holding's principle of the extended presence. 
For my final example, we'll fast forward again, now to 1976, the bicentenary of the publication of The Wealth of Nations. The University of Chicago Press brought out a one-volume reprint of the classic Edwin Canaan edition, one that carried a preface by another Chicago economist, George Stigler. And it is a classic Stiglerian uh, performance, acknowledging that the Chicago edition would compete with the then being released Clarendon Press or Glasgow edition of Smith's works. He felt obligated to point out that his own edition had three substantial advantages over the Glasgow edition. It's it is less encumbered with editorial material. It has useful marginal summaries of the texts. And as Smith would observe, it is a good deal cheaper. Now, I, I should point out that there is a Liberty Fund uh, edition, uh, a paperback edition of the Glasgow uh, uh, Press edition, which is considerably cheaper than the Chicago one. So it, it's, it's no longer true what he just said. Got you. OK. There are other nice touches. Stigler's preface, for example, is, a, is dated June 5, 1976. June 5 is typically given as the date of Smith's birth. Anyway, in the preface, Stigler lays out what might be called the quintessential Chicago school reading of Adam Smith, as follows, and I, I, I'm quoting Stigler. Uh, the fundamental explanation of man's behavior in Smith's view is found in the rational, persistent pursuit of self-interest. Stigler then quotes the celebrated line from Book 1, Chapter 1 of, of The Wealth of Nations, it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we can expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Now, Stigler follows this with his own statement that the drive of self-interest, which the modern economist has labeled utility-maximizing behavior, is always present in the wealth of nations. And on this behavioral basis, Smith constructed a theory of how markets work. In sum, Adam Smith had, on the 200th anniversary of the publication of the book, been transformed into a Chicago school economist. Now, of course, 1976 was about the time that the Chicago school was uh, truly ascending in the profession. Economics and imperialism was really taking off. So the new interpretation, as was true of those earlier interpretations, had a definite purpose, as arguments from authority always do. I'll simply point out the delicious irony that the Adam Smith resurrected by Stigler bears a sti striking resemblance to the one that critics like the German historical school and institutionalist accused him of being and the one that the earlier Chicago economist Jacob Feiner had shown to be an unfair caricature. So after hearing this story, who would dare suggest that economics is anything other than a cumulatively progressive science? <laughs> that's, that's meant as a joke. If you didn't hear it, you can read the paper. OK, with enough of that, uh, I'll now turn over the podium to some people who actually offer some interpretations of Adam Smith. So thank you very much. <laughs> I'll wait till the end. I'm a general for all. Okay. Uh, Bruce? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, I'll start with my, my usual disclaimer in case anyone's wondering. I'm sadly no relation to Adam Smith, even though my name is Smith and I'm Scottish. Um, if you get nothing else from what I say, you can impress your friends by saying you once went to Edinburgh and heard someone called Smith talk about the wealth of nations. Um, what I want to talk to you about, as Bruce has, has mentioned, is, is the connection between other aspects of Smith's work and his economics. Um, he's famous to most people who've heard of him outside of academia as the father of economics, but he was, of course, the professor of moral philosophy at the University of Glasgow. And if we're thinking about what lessons we can draw for contemporary economics from Smith's thought, I think one of the things we can think about, or one of the ways into thinking about him, is how he saw the connection between this wider academic discipline of moral philosophy in 18th century Scotland and what has become a more specialised academic discipline of economics in the 21st century. Now, as Bruce um, has already alluded to, most Adam Smith scholars no longer recognise the existence of the Adam Smith problem in the, in the way that it was put across by his 19th century German um, interpreters. And I think one of the ways in which we can understand why that that's actually such a misplaced way of trying to understand Smith is by viewing what he has to say within the context of this wider 18th century Scottish discipline of moral philosophy, which included moral philosophy, politics, jurisprudence, sociology, economics, literary criticism, a whole range of disciplines that are now distinct academic endeavours. 
And what I want to do is um, try and illustrate this by focusing in on a discussion of one of the central concepts from the Wealth of Nations um, and try and read that and talk about it in the light of what he says about the same concept in the theory of moral sentiments. And that's the, I the idea or the concept of self-interest or prudence. And what I want to suggest is that you cannot understand what Adam Smith means by prudence or self-interest without reading the theory of moral sentiments. Now, the first thing I want to say about the theory of moral sentiments, of course, is that we have to appreciate it also in its context. An 18th century moral philosophy was a very different endeavour from contemporary moral philosophy. One of the easiest ways to grasp the distinction between the two is to point to something or a distinction that's made by um, Adam Smith's great friend, David Hume. And he said there's a distinction between two types of moral philosopher. The moral philosopher as anatomist and the moral philosopher as painter. The moral philosopher as painter is somebody who seeks to understand what the good is, what justice is, how people ought to live their lives. The moral philosopher as anatomist is the person who tries to understand how human beings actually behave and think about morality. Hume saw himself as an anatomist, and Smith, following on from that, saw himself as an anatomist. Now, that's not to say that he doesn't have normative ideals, but it's to say that, first and foremost, he wants to understand what human beings are actually doing when they behave morally or economically. And what that means is when you engage in a theoretical study of that, a science of it, there is a, an empirical basis against which to check your theory. If your theory does not explain what people are actually doing, there's something wrong with your theory. This is more apparent, I think, in Smith's moral philosophy than it is in his economics. And one way to see this is to look at how he talks about other schools of moral philosophy. The ancient schools of the Stoics and the Epicureans, the selfish system of Bernard Mandeville and Thomas Hobbes, and even the moral sense philosophy of his own teacher, Francis Hutcheson. And Smith says each of these theories grasps something about the reality of making a moral judgment but it misses other things. And it misses it because it focuses in on one principle. Each of these moral schools desires to explain systematically all of moral experience from one core principle, whether that principle is self-interest, it's benevolence, it's utility, or something like that. And Smith's approach is instead to say, well, each one of these theories captures something about what it is to make a moral judgment. But an accurate theory of how human beings actually engage in moral judgment will have to capture all of them. And so Smith's own theory, based on sympathy and the impartial spectator, is supposed to bring together all of these distinct elements of our moral experience and explain to us how we as individuals actually make moral decisions. So when Smith starts the theory of moral sentiments with the famous phrase, how selfish soever mankind may be supposed, this is what he's setting the agenda for the rest of the book with. Human beings are on occasion selfish. They are on occasion individuals who act <coughs> from self-interested um, motivations. But that's not a principle that allows us to explain the totality of human behavior. All of the other elements of human motivation and all of the other kind of ideals that they pursue also have to be part of your theory if that theory is to be an accurate anatomical explanation of human moral experience. So with that in mind, I think we can understand this general methodology as something which he also applies in the wealth of nations. It is, after all, an inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations. He's deploying the same overall scientific, as he sought, theory to the explanation of the wealth of nations. And he's doing the same in judging other systems of explaining economic phenomena. He's using evidence, he's using examples to demonstrate why other political economists and their systems fail to be able to explain economic phenomena in the same way that his system is able to do. So what we can do if we think about this overall systematic scientific approach that Smith's adopting is understand a little bit more clearly what it is that he's doing when he talks about particular elements of economic experience. And the one that I want to talk about in particular is how he actually draws a distinction between two levels of analysis, if you want to call it that. One of them, famously, is the analysis of the unintended consequences of individual behaviour. 
This is the idea that you can look at patterns that emerge from economic activity on the national level and generalize about the principles that operate behind it. But you can also talk about the principles that motivate and direct the behavior of particular individuals. So what is it that individuals do when they're engaging in economic activity? What motivates them? How do they think? And these two things are going on at the same time. But I want to suggest to you that the second of these, the individual level motivation, is far better described in the theory of moral sentiments than it is in the wealth of nations. And so by reading the two of them together, one can grasp some of the points that Smith's making, which might appear isolated in the wealth of nations. One way that we can see this is if we look at a famous observation that he makes about his own system of natural liberty, where he says that he doesn't expect Great Britain to become a utopia of free trade. Why does he not expect that? Because the interests of individuals stand against it. So he's willing to make a distinction between what he draws as a set of policy recommendations about things that he would like to see and his explana explanatory account of how individuals will actually behave in economic settings. The unintended consequences, of course, principles lie behind some of the most famous observations in the wealth of nations. He finds that the division of labor, the central organizing principle of the book, is the result of the unintended consequence of individuals working together and gradually developing that system. He finds that the fall of the feudal order is the result of the feudal lords trucking and bartering and exchanging um, their wealth for trinkets and baubles, something which he believes, although unintended, is a revolution which brings about a real change in, uh, in society and, and indeed is, is, a, 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 is something that advances human happiness. But when he comes to talk about what individuals are motivated by as part of that process, he talks about the principle that or the propensity, as he would put it, that human beings have, that all human beings have that comes with them from birth and never leaves them until they go into the grave, which is the desire to better their condition. Providing conditions of legal security allows individuals to pursue that behavior. And one of the, the really interesting things that he does in The Wealth of Nations, he talks about how different people pursue different strategies to better their own condition. And the one that he focuses in on, which is often obscured, perhaps by the focus on the first part of, of, of the wealth of nations, is the idea that individuals have a propensity to save and to accumulate capital. We have then a discussion as he goes on where he's setting up um, different accounts of how human beings can behave. They can behave like the feudal lords, like prodigals who dissipate their capital in pursuit of their own comfort, or they can behave like, as he believes, the vast majority of people behave carefully and soundly accumulating capital in a gradual fashion from saving. The interesting thing, if we read Wealth of Nations through theory of moral sentiments, is of course that if we look at TMS, there are also character sketches of the prodigal and the prudent man in the theory of moral sentiments. And so if we want to add some depth to the analysis that goes on in the Wealth of Nations, we can look to what he says in the theory of moral sentiments about these people. We can try to understand what it is that motivates them, what they're likely to do, how they're likely to behave better by viewing them within the context of his wider moral philosophy than we can within the discussion which he provides us with in The Wealth of Nations. So in The Wealth of Nations, he famously says, every prodigal appears a public enemy, every frugal man a public benefactor. And one might then lead him, well, this one might lead a reader to believe that he would then come up with a philosophy or a set of policy um, suggestions which would <coughs> seek to prevent people acting in a prodigal fashion, seek to prevent people becoming a public enemy. But instead he doesn't do that. He goes back to his central task of looking at how people actually behave. He goes back to the anatomy of how people behave in a moral and in an economic setting. And he points out that most people in a society most of the time act in a parsimonious fashion. And that this in itself, this strategy of gradual accumulation of, um, of capital from saving by the prudent man, cancels out the levels of prodigality that you find in some individuals like the feudal lords. And indeed what he talks about is how this particular strategy affects the way that different individuals interact in economic exchanges. Now if we go 
to the theory of moral sentiments, we find him discussing exactly the same thing. We find him talking about the virtue of prudence. And the virtue of prudence is not one of the higher virtues. It's not something where we look at someone and think they are morally praiseworthy because they behave in a prudent fashion. But instead, for Smith, it's a kind of baseline. It's what's necessary for someone to live a successful life, and it's what's necessary for a successfully functioning economy. So if we understand what Smith is saying between these two books, we can actually build up a far richer version or far richer understanding of his conception of what an economic actor is. It's somebody who is, in a sense, the prudent man that we see discussed and explained to us in the theory of moral sentiments. That form of behavior is observable. And he comes up with lots of nice little examples from everyday life to illustrate the different character sketches that he uses throughout the theory of moral sentiments. So by looking at the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth of nations together, we can actually come up with a richer understanding of the sorts of individuals that Smith is talking about. By understanding Smith's discipline as moral philosophy, including political economy or economics, we can come to see that he actually has a lot more to tell us than perhaps might first be revealed by simply reading The Wealth of Nations. So if I was to make a suggestion of what I thought that contemporary economics could take from Adam Smith, I would suggest that they read the theory of moral sentiments and that they read the actor that Smith describes, the human that Smith describes in that very rich account of human moral experience as the actor that he's talking about when he's talking about the wealth of nations. Thanks. Thank you. Now, Johnny. OK. <clears throat> Thank you very much. I think I have a presentation, so I am asking for some help to have this presentation on the, on the screen here, if possible. All right. It's there, great. Ah, it's over there. Okay, fine. Uh, so after the great work that Bruce and Craig have done, you know, talking about putting, uh, how to say, the contribution of Adam Smith in a setting, what I'm trying to do is really to uh, ask you to take, even if you are eating and sitting there, to, through a, a very short and long journey from, uh, let's say, what, uh, the, what is the, which are the messages that, in a sense, we can bring back to our days from these thinkers of the Enlightenment, and Adam Smith in particular. I've been working on development economics for quite some time recently, and so really I've been trying to think about, okay, what, which are the lessons that we can make use of? Uh, the, 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 the journey is really a journey which I recall from use values and the decent society to the exchange values and the age of financial mercantilism and the bridging between classical political economy and what the market is. What is a decent so society? Well, it is nice colors that you have over there. Uh, I'm sorry, you have to look over there. This has been approved a couple of years ago by the UN General Assembly in New York City, of course. And this is what today most development econo economists or people just working on development would say are the real goals, the targets for 2030. These are the definition of, you know, what we could call a decent society. Uh, you could see there that there are 17 uh, target goals, 169 targets, 241 indicators. By now, indicators are more than 300, so there is plenty of work to be done. One of these targets, goals, sorry, number two is... Uh, zero hunger in the world, which now we are sitting and eating here, so it's a bit, so I, I, I'll go over, okay? Uh, all right. Um, the 17 goals have been grouped into five areas of special importance. The first two I would have liked, people and planet, human beings and natural resources, and all goals, all targets should have three dimensions of sustainability, social, environmental, and economic sustainability. Some of the goals, look at there, they are particularly challenging, of course. Uh, they, they are written there, have been agreed in one way or the other, whatever that means, okay? Full employment, decent work, 
Number 10, reduce inequality among countries and within countries. We have already been talking about inequality this morning, of course, and we will be talking more. And 12, sustainable consumption and production system, whatever that means. Okay, what can classical political economy tell us about this decent society, these very special use values, which are not just basic goods or necessaries, they are also social relationships, of course. What, the, what is the decent work if not a social relationship in many ways? Okay, let me start from the mercantilist period. So here I really have to be on a, on a very sketchy presentation. Uh, the mercantilist period and Thomas Moon, a, a director of the East India Company himself, the British one, of course, not the Dutch one, but 1601, 1602, that's when the two companies have been established. Okay, and by the way, the British East India Company have, has been running uh, uh, India up to 58, 1858, so it was exerting power there, okay? So there are many possible definitions of what you call mercantilist approach, protectionist, of course, a surplus in the balance of trade, Balance, imbalances, okay? We have already been mentioning imbalances this morning. Uh, Antonella Stirati, Steven Fassari, they have been telling us about secular stagnation, this type of issue. Of course, where does profit come from if you are a merchant? Buying cheap and selling dear, okay? And that was the principle also for nations, all right? But the major issue you like to point out your attention is that this was built on an strong alliance between the big merchant companies and the nation states. The classical political economists in one way or the other reacted to that, of course, Adam Smith, uh, 1776, uh, book four is an attack on mercantilism, but the story begins a bit earlier. Uh, maybe you remember the five areas of critical importance in the definition of this society today. Here is Petty, 1662, Land and labor as the principle from which you get everything. And we had people and planet there, human beings and natural resources. Then, of course, in this idea of classical political economy, which physical reproduction is very important, meaning use values, the physical characteristics of goods are extremely important, and that also in, in physiocracy, Kenny, 1758, Laissez-faire is an expression that we use very much. Some people bring back this expression to Kene, not terribly appropriate, but that's for another occasion. This is a guy who in many ways uh, in inspired French Enlightenment, and I would say also the Scottish Enlightenment in many ways. Here, uh, let's just go to the, to the third quote, which is about the problem of the so-called uh, du commerce, sweet trade, but sweet trade was meant as a reaction, as an opposition to the domination of landlords and their aristocracy. Of course, Montesquieu is very well known for his idea of the separation of powers, and here we come to Adam Smith. Bruce and Craig have already done most of the work. I just can give a message, which I share, I think, with them. Market is there, self-interest is there, of course, but as you said, for the human beings, market is not enough. And don't think that market can do everything. Uh, in Smith, but in the Enlightenment, particularly the Scottish Enlightenment, the, the story of the rise and fall of nations, of course, which is David Hume, Ms. Ferguson. So societies can be in different stages. And of course, there is the natural order of investment in which if you have a look, foreign trade doesn't come first, foreign trade comes last. Several quotes of how damaging can be the alliance between the merchants and the nation states. They come from book four of the Wealth of Nations. Uh, and then the labor market. The labor market is a typical case in which there is this problem of the imbalances between the two parties, which have indeed different interests. Some other quotes, these quotes, they come from book one of the Wealth and they tell you why the master manufacturers, that's the way he calls mainly what we call the capitalist entrepreneur, master manufacturer. So it's not only a matter of the merchant, 
the bad guys, sorry, are not just the merchants, the master manufacturers as well, the entrepreneurs, okay? Why? Because there is an imbalance of power between the two sides, and that is very damaging. The reasons are there. I've synthesized these reasons, of course, in which could be the problem of the so-called laboring poor. Remember that one of the sustainable development goals is about full employment and decent work. And we know that the condition of laboring poor is still widespread all around the, the world. Smith thought that this uh, alliance between merchants, manufacturers, and, uh, and the state, the use of the state power, could lead, lead to increasing imbalances, but that could be, uh, hopefully be uh, reduced, okay? Uh, may very easily be prevented, these growing imbalances. Uh, with Ricardo and Marx, we move to the world of uh, exchange value. And uh, use values are the physical uh, reality, the, the material condition. Here, Ricardo opens with a chapter on value. Marx opens a, uh, the capital with a chapter on the commodity. That's it. Now we are in the age. And here we come to our age. Okay? This is the when the world, I think, changed after Bretton Woods, of course. These are trillion dollars. Nowadays, the total amount of financial derivative is not 35 trillion, but is 700 trillion, nine times the world GDP, whatever the GDP is. Uh, we can talk about that later. So there is a new mercantilism, I think, in which really the, the, the alliance with the weak powers and the nation states, the power is still there. But mind you, it's not just to ask for duties or to ask for protection if you have to conquer a, a different piece of land. Uh, stay out, eh, the, the regulation. Now the market, that's the dominant narrative, can take care of a lot of things, trickle down growth, if you wish. Or financial funds, they will flow where they will get a higher return. So nothing more is needed. And don't confuse mercantilism with state intervention. It can be stay out because we can do better. Financial mercantilism is still buying cheap and selling dear. Thinks of how people make money. Uh, don't think of benefactors that we know. I mean, that, that's a different story. Which, uh, but, but I mean, people make money in financial markets. I put a question mark between money and money because obviously we know that there is something in between, but it's a bit more complicated. Uh, mercantilism is a zero-sum game, like all mercantilism, but you might have bubbles. So people can think that they all can make money until you have systemic risk. I'm a Minsky, of course. Uh, now people talk about the Minsky moment. And of course, these type of investments are very much short term, and that's an impact also on uh, investments and growth. Some paradoxes, secular stagnation, the savings glut, too much savings. In Arrow's model, higher saving ratio is good for the, uh, the economic growth. But particularly, look at point two. Go back to the East Asian economic growth example model, all reinvested profits, not from international finance, okay? So domestic savings and what about this international financial market? It has been bypassed, of course, since one year ago, the yuan is part of the group of five currencies which are in the special drawing rights system, but I mean, it's very tiny. That doesn't have much to do with and the problem is now that in financial market, you have some giants which do control them. Remember the problem of imbalances. Eh? Let's go back to, so almost 50% of returns in this financial market, they go just to five big, six, sorry, big investment banks. Very much unbalanced. What to do? Rebalancing. Rebalancing is what many countries ask for, if you look the ANCTA the reports, uh, several think tanks, of course, there is now the search for a decent society is not just putting there some goals or targets, it's how can we proceed through, through that. 
and that has to do with trying to find a way of rebalancing these imbalances which are growing more and more. Of the 17 goals, this is the last one on global partnership. And these are the things we are supposed, or countries are supposed to discuss. Finance, technology, trade. To make a deal, to make agreements. But, you know, policy, institutional coherence. How can you negotiate when you have the laboring poor and the master manufacturers in many ways? That's the issue. That, do we find a way out of that? That's separation of banking, Glass-Steagall, for the Americans that's obviously eh, repealed in 1999, uh, and now we have Dodd-Frank, Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. And in Europe, we have these markets in financial derivatives instruments uh, directive. It's a way to try to intervene, to control finance, which I don't think will be very successful. I mean, the problem is there. Eh? How can we invent ways? Three slides to go. An example of uneven game or uneven powers. Eh? Uh, financial markets on one side, and of course, a country, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo on the, on the other side. Uh, that's an extreme example of saying in which, in which way, uh, let's say, the world, uh, the, the realm of exchange values and the realm of use values of people can come to a, a, to a problem, to a confrontation. And it's still there, and, and it comes from the early 80s. 35 years back. Okay, people have been talking about, go, uh, some of the debates. James Boswell, 1766, the debate between Hume and, and Rousseau, okay? Uh, the print uh, is not a poetry, it's a print, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you have three characters, choose your character if you wish, okay? Hume, Rousseau, or Voltaire, or make a combination of the three. Personally, I stay with the monkeys at the back. Uh, how different mankind is, and uh, okay, and that's all. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about some of the reactions to Adam Smith and early economic thinking, and I'm going to talk to you about the romantic perspective. Um, I think that's a great thing to talk about here at INET because INET was born out of a romantic impulse to challenge the status quo and to move us towards something better. The origin of the word romance is about storytelling. It's about telling stories in the language of ordinary people, not just the language of the priests. And I think that's also very important to what we do here. Um, I'm going to focus on William Wordsworth because he was a very prominent romantic poet, lived a great long life, became poet laureate, and also because he's known as the romantic poet who is the healer of the spirit. Um, John Stuart Mill once said that reading Wordsworth saved him from a nervous breakdown, so maybe it can help us uh, here in these tumultuous times. So what did Wordsworth think of Adam Smith? The answer is not much. Uh, here's a quotation from a letter of 1815. Adam Smith is the worst critic, David Hume not accepted, that Scotland, a soil to which this sort of weed seems natural, has produced. <laughs> Didn't mince any words there. Uh, by critic, he really means thinker. People weren't making these distinctions between literary critics and moral philosophers and economists that we make now. So what was Wordsworth's beef with Adam Smith? Well, a lot of it had to do with their life experiences. Adam Smith, as you may know, was a man of the town. He uh, taught in universities. He worked at the Customs House in Edinburgh. He was in coffee houses, drawing rooms, parlors. He was seeing the new bourgeoisie develop uh, with all their sort of jockeying for position and posturing. And he may not have been terribly impressed with what he saw. He saw people as given to vanity and given to self-interest. And you know, they had some better instincts. And hopefully commercial society would help to nurture those and would help them learn to cooperate with each other. Uh, so he was a little bit, you know, maybe pessimistic about human beings, but optimistic about um, how they could flourish in this new economic order that, that was developing. Wordsworth came from a completely different world. He grew up in the Lake District, a wild part of England. He became an orphan 
uh, when his father died, his father was owed a great sum of money by a very nasty and wealthy landowner, local landowner, and who refused to pay the family back, leaving the children impoverished. Wordsworth grew up with his mother's clan in Cumberland, roaming the countryside, uh, communing with nature. He was actually the first person to use that term. And he loved talking to people. He loved talking to shepherds and farmers and beggars and vagrants. He developed a tremendous respect for these people. Um, he did not see himself as superior to them. It wasn't a patronizing respect the way uh, people expected from the educated classes. He, in fact, he saw these people often as his own superiors. He saw that having meaningful work and dignity and connection with other human beings and connection to nature uh, brought out the best in people. And uh, people were able to develop a sense of benevolence under those conditions. Uh, so he then, uh, enough money is scraped together to send him to Cambridge University where he becomes a radical in the lead up to the French Revolution. Like many of his contemporaries, he was disillusioned by how that uh, ended up, the bloodiness and so on and turned his back on some of the ideas of the radical intelligentsia, but he maintains a focus on the ordinary person. He sort of moves away from abstract ideas of the human being, but wants to focus on human beings, uh, what motivates them, what brings out the best in them, uh, uh, how they think, how they feel, how they believe. Um, so he's, 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 he's very much a, a poet of consciousness and, um, and emotion, human emotion. So what he sees, he has a few more decades to observe the Industrial Revolution than Adam Smith did. And he sees the human spirit as getting crushed rather than elevated. Um, in this quotation from his autobiographical uh, poem, The Prelude, he says, society has parted man from man, neglectful of the universal heart. He feels that commercial society is encouraging people to exploit each other. It's not bringing out the best in people. People have uh, jobs that are boring, that don't motivate them, that are not stimulating their minds. He believes that human freedom is about the stimulation of the mind which comes from nature and having meaningful work, um, and that is something that is getting destroyed. So he's, he's, uh, he's, he's very disappointed in what he sees. People are getting displaced. They're dealing with uncertainty, the vicissitudes of prices. Um, they're really seeing themselves as part of it, organized around an economic system that they don't have any control over. Another place where the Romantics and uh, Wordsworth in particular differed from Adam Smith and his cohorts was their view of science. Um, Smith was very much painted as a Newtonian by the time Wordsworth was writing, which is perhaps unfair to Adam Smith and maybe even unfair to Newton, uh, who we now know was into things like alchemy and divination, not exactly the cold, hard man of science. Um, and, and Smith certainly didn't think that science was the final word, and as we've heard, thought that theories should evolve and that science should progress with new discoveries. But he was getting a bit of a bad rap at the time, getting painted as somebody who was in with the crowd who wanted to come up with very mechanistic, uh, simplistic uh, notions of, of how uh, the universe operates and how human beings operate. Wordsworth was not anti-science. In fact, when he was writing his great autobiographical poem, The Prelude, he was reading Erasmus Darwin. He was reading the early psychologist David Hartley. He was hanging out with uh, Sir Humphrey Davy, the boy wonder chemist poet, who was uh, apparently a lot of fun to hang out with. He carried a bag of nitrous oxide with him wherever he went, also known as laughing gas, much to the light of uh, Wordsworth's close friend Coleridge. Uh, but that aside, uh, Wordsworth is definitely not anti-science, but he is suspicious of scientific expertise. He is suspicious of scientific certainty. He is um, very skeptical of the notion of trying to control nature and use it as an instrument. He fears that if we're going to use nature as an instrument, we're probably going to end up using each other as instruments. So he's concerned about that. He believes that scientists need poetry because where science is... Scientists focus on the intellect, poets focus on both the intellect and the heart, and if you leave the heart out of any discussion, you have made a fatal omission. And lest, lest this sound fanciful, there was a scientist of the next generation who read a great deal of Wordsworth's poetry, in fact, poured over six volumes of it while he was working on a very interesting theory. He saw that Wordsworth put the human being back into nature, connected the human being to animals, to plants, to the rhythms of nature, and that scientist was Charles Darwin, and he was inspired by Wordsworth when he was writing The Origin of Species. <laughs> 
Okay, another area where the Romantics differed from the economic thinkers of their day had to do with wealth, the distribution of wealth, and poverty. Um, Smith, of course, was no dummy, and he knew that institu institutions favored the rich, and he was also concerned that people were going to have boring, meaningless jobs in this new economic order, um, and expressed that concern in The Wealth of Nations. However, he believed that this was necessary for economic growth, that eventually there was going to be some trickle down, ordinary people were going to have more leisure time, they were going to have more comforts, and, you know, and things were going to gradually get better. Um, Wordsworth had a different perspective, again, seeing uh, more of the early results of the Industrial Revolution unfolding. And uh, he actually believed that poverty was not a result of any defect of moral character. It wasn't something we needed to talk about in terms of laissez-faire economics. He thought that it was point blank an injustice, a result of injustice, and it was unnatural. And he saw that the new economic system that was developing was concentrating wealth into the hands of the few at the expense of the many, and that most people were going to end up in uh, very dispiriting low-wage jobs. And he was um, quite concerned about that quite prescient. So what can we take from the romantic attitude towards economic thinking? Um, I think we can take a lot. I think if we were to be inspired by Wordsworth and the romantics, we would see that um, it is necessary for the health of the individual as well as societies to see themselves as connected to nature and living in uh, harmony with it rather than opposition to it. I think that we would take the lesson that human beings uh, need to have purpose in their lives and meaningful, dignified work, and we would bring that, uh, that insight into our discussions of things like basic income, for example. Um, I think we would take the lesson that scientists can, and social scientists can use a visionary perspective and the habits of mind of the artists, that these are quite important, and that uh, perhaps once in a while we need to put down our computer models, uh, perhaps take a walk outside, and uh, attune ourselves to the imagination, which, as Wordsworth said, is the most exalted form of human reason. And this will uh, allow us to come forth into the light of things. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Let me you. Yeah. Good. And now from that wonderful varied set of comments here, uh, Gonzalo Fonseca will make sense of it all. <laughs> um, I, I'd love to be able to do that. Um, these were wonderful papers. I, I really enjoyed every one of them. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to make sense of it all, but I, I do want to bring some themes that you had in common and, and maybe ask you to clarify some of them. Um, now, now, Karl Marx uh, tells us that philosophers have so far only interpreted the world uh, and that the point is to change it. Yet the one thing I think we're getting out of all these papers in these panels is a different conclusion that economists and legislators have been such, in such a rush to change the world that they've actually forgotten to interpret it or certainly how to interpret Smith correctly. Um, uh, this does not apply, of course, to the first two authors Bruce mentioned, uh, Boulding and Viner, uh, which were impeccable scholars. And, and, uh, and, and very innovative theorists, a rare breed uh, that, would, uh, that doesn't exist that often anymore. Uh, but he certainly made it clear uh, that the German historical school, uh, the American institutionalists, the Chicago school, and others have failed in interpretation and reduced Adam Smith to a, a bit of a caricature uh, and often uh, turned into a blueprint for very simplistic uh, laissez-faire policies rather than more subtle, uh, the, uh, acknowledging the, more, uh, the, more, the bigger subtleties of it. The Wealth of Nations is a complex, uh, sprawling uh, treatise of five long books, and it frequently gets reduced to a single phrase. Uh, this is the famous one of, that it's not from the benevolence of the butcher, etc., that we expect our dinner, but from regard to their own self-interest. Uh, but what is self-interest? And I, I think... Uh, in the theory of moral sentiments, um, Adam Smith makes it clear that self-interest is not always actual material advantage, but often the hope for admiration, its vanity, its pride. The meaning of betterment of self is not always clear that it means more than just more material wealth. I think Professor Craig Smith has you know, done a wonderful job in showing us that Adam Smith's vision is not one-dimensional. 
that the, his vision of man is that it is a creature that is much more uh, multifaceted and complicated than that. And, um, and self-interest also is not enough. Um, man lives in a society, and sort of one of the paradoxes that comes out of Adam Smith is precisely that to actualize your self-interest, you have to need cooperation from other people, and that competition can throw this off. As, as I think as Professor Smith uh, uh, emphasized, self-interest does not always translate into um, purposive and uh, planned outcomes, uh, but often leads to inadvertent outcomes. Uh, in the words of, Sm of uh, Smith's younger contemporary, and I mean Adam's, not, not Professor Greg Smith, uh, 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 younger contemporary, Adam Ferguson, uh, that societies stumble on establishments which are indeed the result of human action, but not the execution of any human design. Now try capturing that in an Euler equation. <laughs> um, so maybe Adam Smith has actually more in common uh, with the man of feeling that Wordsworth was talking about, uh, that Dr. Paramore has described. Uh, but Wordsworth was also facing an England where there was a certain agenda that was being pushed by the students, not of Adam Smith, but of Dougal Stewart, who was in turn a student of Adam Smith. Um, many of them uh, who went on to become uh, famous uh, leaders of, of the Whig Party, uh, people like Lord John Russell and Viscount Palmerston, uh, Henry Broome. Uh, the, they were part of what was called the Whig Liberal Party at the time, and they were pushing forward their agenda of reform, uh, of dismantling social safety nets and foisting free markets and laissez-faire policy on a Britain that was reluctant to accept it. And the Whigs claimed the mantle of Adam Smith as the justification for these policies. And these rough, cold, if you want to call them free market policies that would culminate in tragic consequences during the Irish, in the Irish famine in the 1840s. The Irish poet uh, uh, Butler Yeats would later ask, well, what is Whiggery? And, and answer the question himself, it's, it's a leveling rancorous, rational sort of mind that never looked out of the eye of a saint or out of a drunkard's eye. <laughs> this is not Adam Smith. Theory of moral sentiments is full of saints and drunkards. <laughs> um, Professor Vaji talks about economic development goals. And he sees the blueprints that are delivered by economists, the blueprints that have been issued many times in the name of, of Adam Smith. And I believe he correctly identifies that these blueprints are actually more evocative of mercantilist precepts than anything Smith would have endorsed. So I, I'd like to ask each of our panelists sort of to conclude, when, how, and why did this come about? <clears throat> how did the real Adam Smith, who was a complex, a subtle thinker, with a great and deep awareness of institutional and historical context, become this simple one-dimensional icon? How did a philosopher who produced not one but two treatises to help us understand society get turned into a legislative blueprint for organizing society? And even if we interpret the wealth of nations as a blueprint, as a means to one end, when did it become an end in itself? When did the maximization of national wealth become the ultimate scope of human society. And as Woodsworth, I'm sure, uh, would have asked, should not the, end, the value of the end determine the value of the means? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now, those are very profound questions for the panel, so I thought maybe we'd open it up and accumulate a few more questions and then let the panel talk about them uh, in summary. So feel free to take a piece of paper if you want to get them down. And one down here I saw earlier. Yeah. yeah. And folks, remember, we have eight minutes, and we've got to finish on time. <laughs> Can I ask a, a question about the theory of moral sentiments and yeah, the global speak financial... speak up or get the, the microphone closer to you. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, my question is about the theory of moral sentiments and the global financial crisis. And, and I ask it humbly because once upon a time I was the Adam Smith Professor of Political Economy 
at Glasgow University, uh, and uh, whatever. Uh, uh, um, and uh, my uh, my question is, is based on the Adam Smith. The yeah, quick. yeah, sure. My, uh, the Adam Smith problem is still here. The first sentence of the Wealth of Nations is about selfishness. It led to the first fundamental theorem of welfare economics, to the efficient markets hypothesis, and from that to leverage, overborrowing, and the crisis. The first sentence of the theory of moral sentiments says, howsoever selfish we regard people, they have regard for the concerns of others. And Smith talks about approbation, esteem, and altruism. I want to ask, how can altruism, altruism, esteem, and concern for others help us to think about fixing the financial system? That would be the Adam Smith problem in action. Thank you. I think, I think we don't actually have more time for more We don't right have now. more yeah, time. Do have more okay. Time. Do we have a few minutes to uh, get the panel to yes. say, okay, limit it to one or two sentences? Yes, okay. <laughs> Well, we'll just take you, Lynn, you will go across. There. In answer to Gonzalo's questions for the romantics, I think the interpretation of Adam Smith became distorted when Malthus published his essay on population. That actually came out the same year that Wordsworth and Coleridge published the lyrical ballads. And because he was discussing, Malthus was discussing Adam Smith at length, length they got painted with the same brush, and the romantics definitely had a, a great distaste for utilitarian discussions of economics and quantifiable data. And I guess the answer to, uh, to this gentleman's question is um, if, if we want to think about altruism in the financial crisis, we would have to think about the impact uh, that, that, that policies um, are going to have on ordinary people. And we'll understand, we would understand that our, we share a common fate and that uh, we're all connected. OK, fine. Well, <coughs> in terms of the, uh, the misinterpretations, if we can put it that way, I mean, that, People might, might still hold to some of the interpretations that I, that I talked about. Of the German historical school and of the Chicago school, uh, each of those interpretations had specific interests that they, that they promoted. So it's quite easy to understand why, why those interpretations might have emerged at those points in time. Now, more generally, uh, I think the role of historians of economics, one of the roles of historians of economics is to say, well, here's what the person actually said. And if you're trying to make an argument from authority or trying to dismiss an argument from authority and replace it with another authority, at least get the authorities right. So that's one of the, one of the roles, at least, of, of the historian of economics. So yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> well, uh, for sure, I mean, uh, the interpretation of Adam Smith went through one century of revisions, uh, which uh, Bruce has just mentioned. Uh, coming to the issue that uh, worried me a bit more, this issue of the growing what I call financial mercantilism, we have to go back to uh, 1976, not for the bicentenary uh, of uh, Adam Smith, Wealth of Nations, but in 1976, there was a famous paper by Bob Lucas on rational expectation, the micro foundation of macroeconomics not on the social determination of our behavior, how to say, but there is something which is there, you know, provided. And another important book, this time uh, in, in England from Oxford, uh, some people might, uh, one is, is a colleague, uh, Bacon and Eltis, Britain's Economic Problems, too, fo too few producers, definitions being, market is productive, the state is unproductive, so you don't need the state, let the market do everything. And then in finance, of course, markets get exaggerated. The final point, we should remember the Wealth of Nation opens with three chapters on the division of labor. And that is the principle he wants to promote in the Wealth yeah. of Nation, as sympathy was the principle. We don't have the third book on the science of the legislator, but mm. that is for you to, to say. Okay. <laughs> I wouldn't presume to. Um, I, I, I think my answer to, to, to the two questions is actually the same thing, which is to say that I think that Smith's reputation started to become so polarized as the academic disciplines became more specialized and as people who read The Wealth of Nations didn't read the theory of moral sentiments. And so a, a, an education in one discipline 
could leave you illiterate in another discipline. And, it, and that works both ways. It works for, for philosophy as well. So if I were to say, well, what could Smith bring to it, then I'd, I'd, I'd make the case for, for, for everyone reading both of the books and for everyone who does economics at university to also do moral philosophy at university. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I want to thank the panel for a wonderful discussion and amplify uh, Craig's comment that almost all economists have access to the wealth of nations. Very few of them have even opened the theory of moral sentiments. So a good, a good prescription for moral sentiments. Peter Temin, thank you so much for running a wonderful session. I think we can, you know, INET uh, will take the authority of here in Scotland dubbing this uh, reread Adam Smith again weekend. Uh, and I want to thank this gentleman, uh, the previous Adam Smith professor, uh, for really asking a profound question, which I think should underlie so many of the other sessions that we're going to have, including the next, uh, the future of the Eurozone, uh, which is back in Pentland Auditorium. Do not follow your guide. Go back to the auditorium uh, where we started. We'll be meeting there uh, in just a few minutes and then talking about the future of the Eurozone, in which I plan to ask that very question which you just posed, because I think it's so important. But a big round of applause for a wonderful discussion of, of Adam Smith and what he means. Thank you so much.